In this video, we're going to be discussing phylogeography, which simply can be defined as the evolutionary study of organisms based on their genetic information in correlation with geographic location. This is important because it can provide inferences about evolutionary history of particular populations, current status about them, as well as speculations about future progress. When we're thinking about the populations, we're thinking about overall looking at genetic diversity and population size. This should no be no secret as we've already talked a little bit about the genetic aspect of this study. What I mean by that is we looked at the idea of phylogenetics in our previous lecture. As we think about phylogenetics, we focus primarily on the idea of looking at genetic information and determining evolutionary relatedness using tree-like diagrams. Well, this isn't the only way that we can draw conclusions based on genetic information. We can also use another method known as haplotype analysis or haplotype networks. As we look at this, one of the things that you wanna think about is what is a haplotype? As we think about what a haplotype is, this should be review for you. A haplotype simply, as we define it, is a unique sequence of bases over a region of a genome. It is suggested that individuals that have the exact same sequence for a particular region are sharing a haplotype, and they are more closely related to one another than to other individuals. This is very important. Now, if you recall, when we discussed looking at phylogenetic analysis, the selection of genetic information is very important when we are drawing conclusions. Typically, most data and most data that you're going to be seeing in this particular presentation focuses on genetic analysis using mitochondrial DNA. This is usually one of the preferred areas to study in the genome as it's uniparentally inherited, typically has higher mutation rates than nuclear DNA, and lacks recombination DNA repair mechanisms. Thus, we can see mutations clearly. As we look at our particular sample set of data here in our example, we will notice that there are five different samples. Sample one, two, three, four, and five. And they've all been color coded to indicate particular haplotypes. So as we look at this, we can indicate that haplotype number one contains sample one, two, and four in orange. We can see haplotype number two is blue, representing our sample number three, and our final haplotype contained within sample number five. As we look at the genetic code that's been provided, you will notice that the anomalies, the mutations, are highlighted in the blue boxes. As we look at each one of our haplotypes, we're going to compare them against one another. Since our first haplotype containing samples one, two, and four, all contain the same genetic code, we are going to use that as a comparison to look at sample three and five. So as we look at these samples, one of the things of interest is if you look at the mutations contained within the boxes, you will notice that they are found in the third, sixth, and twelfth base pair position of the sequence, meaning that each one of them are, are positioned in the third base pair position in a codon. This typically results in a synonymous mutation, one that does not result and a change in amino acid. And that's important when we're thinking about overall protein construction. Now, as we look at comparing these samples, if we look at sample number three, which contains haplotype number two, and compare it to the three samples within haplotype number one, we will see in that third base pair position that the G has been replaced by a C. If we look at positions six and 12 respectively, we can see that they have a T and A respectively, the same base pair that is found in our first haplotype. This cannot be said when we look at our third and final haplotype with sample number five. In sample number five, we will see that the G is the same as haplotype number one in our third base pair position. But if we observe our sixth base, base pair position, we will notice that a C, is replacing the T, and if we look in the 12th, we will see that a T is replacing the A. This results in two base pair differences for our haplotype number three in comparison to our one base pair difference with our haplotype number two. If we use this information, we can construct what is known as a haplotype network or haplotype analysis, what you are seeing off here to the right. As we observe this, you will notice that the diam there are a couple things that are different. 
first of all, each one of these circles represents one of the haplotypes. If we dive in a little bit deeper, we will notice that the diameter of those circles are different. The larger the diameter, that suggests that there are more individuals in your particular sample size that share that particular haplotype. So the bigger it is, the more individuals have it. The other thing we can see looking at this basic diagram is as we observe this diagram, we can see that there's a difference in the distance away from one another. So if we look at the branch lengths that are connecting each one of our haplotypes, we will notice that one is shorter than the other. This length in the branch suggests that there's less genetic difference between our haplotype number one and haplotype number two in comparison to the relationship between haplotype number one and haplotype number three. We can see that the larger distance here also shows the indication of a little dot. That dot or hash mark may be seen on some ha haplotype networks that you observe. A lot of times the actual branch indicates a single difference where some programs will indicate dots or hash marks to represent additional changes in that information. This is not something that's always seen on every haplotype. So think about the relationship between the size of the circles and how far space they are based on the length of branches. Now that we know the basis of haplotype analysis, let's actually look at a real example. Now, as we look at this real example, what we are observing is populations of fruit bats located in Madagascar and the West Indian Ocean Islands. As we observe a initial haplotype network, the first thing I want you to do is just draw some basic conclusions about what you're looking at, the things that are obvious to you. First and foremost, I would always look to see if there's a key when you're looking at your analysis. As you can see here, we see that there is a key that shows two separate species that are being observed. And underneath each one of those initial species, we see little colored blocks. You will find out that those colored blocks represent the geographic location in which we are collecting data for both of those two major species. You will also see that there are four other species that are not categorized within. These are being used as an outgroup comparison, very similar to what we would see as an outgroup on a phylogenetic tree. So as you continue looking, after you notice the key, the other things you want to observe, basic things like we've discussed before, the size differences between the particular circles and what those represent as far as the haplotypes, thinking about the correlation between the number of individuals with one haplotype in comparison to another. One thing you will notice that when we get into large data sets, those circles may look more like pie charts. As we're observing this particular one with one of our species, we will notice that inside that, we have a representation of each one of the four locations that have been sampled, but they are not equally distributed. This suggests that if we look at this, the lighter purple area has more individuals that have that particular haplotype that were sampled in comparison to the other three, which have a relatively equal distribution. We should also notice, looking at all of these, that we will notice that there is interconnections between multiple haplotypes. On our previous example, we were able to observe that one haplotype was connected to another, that was connected to another, kind of in a sequential order. That typically is not how a haplotype network works. A lot of the time we have interconnections depending on the particular mutations that are seen in that sequence and how closely related they are to one another. Other basic conclusions that you can draw. Notice once again, besides the size of the circles, you can also observe the length of the branches and what that correlates with, with regards to genetic diversity. I would also take note into the distribution of colors throughout this particular area. You will notice that if we focus on the top left of this particular diagram, these three clusters all result in the colorations that correspond with one particular species. You can see on the right side that this particular area on the right and down into the bottom left correspond with our other species of interest. So that may give you some suggestion as far as correlation to geographic location based on these two different species. One of the other things I want you to take note, 
besides just simply looking at those main color differences, you may also take a little bit closer note in looking at the actual distribution of coloration within the clusters. You will notice that in our second species that we're observing, you will notice that the clusters are dominated by one particular color. In here, we can see the domination of red. In here, we can see the domination of yellow. That may suggest something about that particular origin or geographic location and the genetic diversity in that particular area. So that may result in further research. One other thing that I want you to take notice before we look at the geographic correlation is I want you to notice those outgroup individuals that were represented by the white, the gray, the black with the A, and then the stripe. Notice how the majority of those alternate species are located out of the main clusters in this haplotype analysis. It's very interesting that one of them is actually embedded into one of the clusters. And what does that actually suggest? Is that was not one of the individuals that was originally species-wise studied in this particular geographic area. Now, typically what we do when we are looking at phylogeography is we collect information on both sides of the study and then we bring them together meaning we collect genetic information and perform an analysis. We get a lot of geographic information and history about where samples were collected, and then we start to draw conclusions. The idea here is as you're collecting genetic samples and geographic samples, you want to start to develop a hypothesis about what you think you're going to see. Kind of leave things as an educated guess. That way, when you look at the, the data side by side, genetic and geographic, you can draw some more accurate conclusions. Like, let's take a look. Initially, as we were going through this particular portion of the PowerPoint, I did not intentionally provide you with the geographic map, as the idea here was that I just wanted you to look at a more complex haplotype network and draw general conclusions just looking at a figure with very little knowledge. Now, since we are going over it in our video, let's see if we can draw some conclusions together. First and foremost, let's look at that initial idea that we looked at. We observed that there were two major areas with regards to where we saw these clusters based on the species type we were observing. The purple, dark and light, the blue and the teal all correspond with a small cluster of islands that are located off Madagascar. So if we look in the northwest of Madagascar, there's a small cluster of islands known as the Comoro Islands. That is where these particular samples were collected from, that series of islands. If we look a little bit more in depth with regards to these, you may wanna think about, is there a correlation between these colorations, the samples, and the actual sample relationships we're seeing from a genetic standpoint? If I was specifically to move the dark circle onto the island it corresponds with, it corresponds with the northernmost island in this cluster. The idea here is looking at this and seeing how all of the dark areas here, the haplotypes that are seen, how does that correspond with the proximity to one another in the cluster analysis and the geographic location? If we look in here, we see a lot of association between the dark area haplotypes and the light purple haplotypes. Well, one may suggest that may, that makes sense because if we look at the next island in this grouping, we will see that that corresponds with the light colored purple. That light colored purple okay, shows a lot of correlation with haplotypes with the dark color. We see a lot of corresponding. If we continue to move down that geographic area of the islands, we will notice that our next most prominent one we see relating in here with regards to haplotypes, we see is the correlation with our teal, teal color. And then last but not least, we see in our furthermost island, the blue coloration, which seems to be fairly isolated. One of the things that's really important to think about is that this initial haplotype where we see the largest number of samples and the largest individuals with it seems to be something that is present on each one of these islands. That could suggest something about the initial history of those populations and how they diversified over time. If we focus on the rest of the network, we can take a look at looking at the correlations of our red, orange, yellow, and green. All of those organisms and the dark gray as well all of those samples were 
came from the actual main Madagascar island. As we look at this, I want you to think about the other big major observation we made, that we seem to have a cluster that's primarily dominated by the red, and we have a cluster that's primarily dominated by the yellow. So if we put those dots in correspondence to their locations, the red would be centrally located in our island, and we can see that up toward the northwest on the coastal area, we can see that the yellow is there. So one of the things that one may speculate is looking in here, we can notice that we have a lot of geographic area that can cover. We can also speculate that in this particular area, we see a cluster that contains a large amount of haplotypes from the majority of those particular now sampled specimens in one area. This may suggest that initially those organisms resided in this area and started to migrate into other locations on, in the island. If we look at the yellow, it should be no surprise that these two clusters are fairly, fairly spaced apart, genetically as well as geographically. This would suggest that in these, over time they become more distant, suggesting that there are adaptations that allow one of these particular groups or populations to survive in that particular area as opposed to this particular grouping right here. Making one successful in the coastal area, one more successful being centrally located. One of the things that's also interested, if, interesting, if we look at that cluster of yellow, notice that the dark gray is actually located in there as well. If we move the dark gray dot into position on the island, one may suggest, looking at this, that there's a drastic difference in the distance between the yellow and the red and the yellow and the gray, which many may suggest that if we look at these, this should be more genetically diverse than this. Why? Because they're further apart. So one may speculate, why are they so close together genetically on this haplotype analysis? Maybe that requires us to look a little bit deeper with regards to thinking about the actual geographic history of those organisms. Another thing while we're thinking about this particular example is you may also want to think a li little bit about the biological characteristics of the organisms that are studying. That way you can think about migration patterns a little bit. These are fruit bats, so they have the ability to fly, so that may suggests something a little bit different with regards to what we're seeing here as far as the haplotype diversity and how in close proximity some of those haplotypes are. The moral of the story here as we're looking at this, we see a lot of genetic diversity in a small particular area and what does that mean over time? When we look at phylogeography, one of the important things that I always like to think about is the fact that Studying this can do a lot about mapping out evolutionary and geographic history of one organism or group of organisms in comparison to another. And haplotypes are one of the easiest ways to look at that. So what I would encourage you to do, the next slide in our presentation gives you an example of looking at woodland brown butterflies, primarily focusing on them in Sweden. I give you this basic haplotype network. What I would encourage you to do, despite the fact it gives you geographic locations on a map, unlike our previous one, I want you to think about what kind of conclusions can you draw simply from looking at the figure before you actually go ahead and look at the provided maps for you in the presentation. See what you can draw genetically before you start to make a correlation between the actual geography of them. Now, I will post supplemental articles on my courses that correspond with a couple of these studies so that you can reference them, as you may find them very useful, particularly the one that looks at the fruit bats that we've provided, because it also does give you a phylogenetic tree that you can look at in comparison to the haplotype network to see if the results are similar. And as always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Shoot me an email. I'm more than willing to help.